Okay, in this presentation, we're looking, first of all, let's look at the introduction and overview, some key examples, and the role of the mantle and subcontinental lithospheric mantle. So let's start with the introduction and overview. First of all, the main consumers of the rest are China, USA, Japan, Korea, Thailand, with China accounting about 60% of the world's consumption. Now, the percentage of global rare earth oxides split by country on the left hand side, as you can see, China takes up about 43%, <clears throat> and the deposit type carbonatites are by far, by far the most common regarding the uh, rare earth mineralization. In terms of uh, what do we use rare earths for? Uh, ceramics, glass, phosphorus, polishing, metallurgy, batteries, catalysts, and magnets. I'm not, I've got nothing to do with that, but uh, just for the general, general information. Now, um, in terms of rare earths, we have light rare earths and heavy rare earths. And yttrium is considered as part of the reds because it shares chemical similarities that occurs with the heavy reds. Now, the major red minerals are bustinazite, um, which is a carbonate, monazite, xenotheme, and apatite. These are the ones that make up, not all of them, but most of them. What do we use the reds for? Well, energy efficiency, lower consumption, compact fluorescent light, hybrid vehicles, weight reduction in cars, wind turbines, and of course, is smaller yet more powerful digital technology, flat panel display, disk drive, digital cameras, and so on. That's what the relays are used for. Unfortunately, there are military applications as well, and I won't go into details about that. Now, in terms of relays deposits, we have magmatic deposits, Ostidine carbonatite, peralkaline and pegmatite systems, and sedimentary deposits, residual plus phosphorites, ion the sodium clay. But I'll focus on the magmatic carbonatite deposits in this talk. So, rare earth mineral system and general characteristics they occur in carbonatites. As rare earth occurs as primary bastinacite, monazite, calcium ferrocarbonatite, hydrothermal absorption, so on. And of course, in alkaline silicate rocks, both in silica saturated and silica undersaturated. And in some hydrothermal deposits like veins, breccia, phenites, and so on, they, you may have rare earth minerals as well. Now, this is a simplified global map of carbonate occurrences from uh, uh, Nacho Gonzalez Alvarez and CSRO, and it shows the distribution of carbonate in the world as we know it. This is distribution of earth deposits from Elliot et al. And uh, as you can see, as you can see, China has quite a big one. One twelve is quite a large one here. Some in in north, northern um, in Scandinavian countries, but mostly, as, again, as you see in China and Mongolia, we have the largest deposits. Let's look at some key examples. The this is a copperhead carbonate which I discovered a long time ago. Uh, traveling there, doing I was doing consulting job with a, a friend of mine. And, um, and we came across this strange thing. It's a cold copperhead because while we were walking there, the copperhead snake came across and we called it a copperhead carbonatite. In general, carbonatite occur as plug-like intrusions, a small subvolcanic intrusion, veins, dikes associated with alkaline ring complexes. And more importantly, carbonatites are a major repository of rare earth minerals. This is the geology of the copperhead carbonate, just for the general um, um, general idea, and it was published in the Australian Journal of Earth Science in 1996. Now, let's look at the classic um, cross section of how carbonate has come about, and of course, some some of those can erupt through the, these these uh, Donio Lengai is a current uh, volcano, which it's a carbonate volcano effectively. And uh, what you see here, you have the, the, the carbonatite in the middle here, cervite, which is a calcic carbonatite, a halo of, of, um, of uh, phonetic alteration. And of course, here you have levels of erosion level and geological record. So we look at geological record down here, up here, up here, and very more rarely 
really in the volcanic system. Oldonio Lengai is a current carbonatite volcano. There's a picture here. It was discovered first time in 19, 1966. They didn't realize it was a carbonatite volcano. And eventually it was found that, that, that black rock is actually mostly calcite. Now, this is a, a hypothetical carbonatite mineral system. Um, I won't go into great details, but essentially you may have residual apatite. We'll see some examples later in the super gene enrichment. And you have various type of ore bodies shown in red. But more importantly, down here, you have a little um, uh, in AU, AUGS classification of carbonatites. You have a calcio carbonatite, magnesium carbonatite, and ferrocarbonatite. Now, it's important to realize that uh, carbonatites and silicate immiscibility, at some stage, they, are in, they, they, they are occur together, but at a certain pressure temperature, the, the immiscibility takes place and the, the two liquids separate. The silica liquid separates from the carbonate liquid. I'm not going to worry too much about that. But basically, what I want to show you here that here you have a, the carbon silicate immiscibility, and then eventually they separate into liquids. One is a, a silicate, and the other one is carbonatite. Now, let's look at some Western Australian carbonatites. We have Gifford Creek up here. And of course, Mount Weld down there, which will be discussed here. The copper red carbon that I mentioned earlier in the Kimberley, it sits up there. Cummings Range is also part of the system. This is a Gifford Creek ferrocarbonatite complex. And they're quite, compli quite complicated because the actual carbonatite seals are down here, but there is additional material. This is, by the way, is the, 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 the alteration, the phonetic alteration, which affects all this huge part of the country above it. So it's a five kilometers, so you can see there's quite an enormous um, uh, carbon suite extent, it's quite enormous. But the main carbon, the ferrocarbon are down here. In this area, the Yangi Bana deposit as a total resource of 1.18% rare earths in 13 million tons, as reported by Border in the OZIMM monograph 32. Now, the other thing which is very interesting, you find that there is in, in the example of immiscible carbonate liquid in sodium silicate. But the important thing here to realize, this is only a thin section. So five, five, five. look at the dynamic of this, this material. So the, this one comes in and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. It's extremely, extremely dynamic. And what we see here is effectively cut side terpenoid, iron carbonate, iron carbonate, and so on and so on and so on. But like the purpose to show this is the, the, the carbonate globules are they are coming very quick, very, very quick. And that they are. There's a photomicrograph. Okay, this is a carbonate globule. And it's something for the 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 um, the emissive, this invisible textures. We have two liquids, iron carbon and a silicate. Now one important thing that the, quite often the phonetic alteration related to carbon dots are called proximal fin. This is an example of proximal phenite and um, it, pervasive potassium phosphorus to crossite and the rock resembles a cyanide. Someone has to be careful. And it took me about quite a while before I realized it wasn't a cyanide, it was actually a, 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 a phenite. This is a carbon, this is more phenetic, more distal. This is a carbon vein infinity alteration on both sides. Now, mineral detected by XRD in the in the in the uh, in the uh, Gifford carbonatites, we have ankerite, magnetite, fedzonite, parochlor, cancrinite, ferrocolumbite, monazite. It's equal a huge number of mineral of the minerals in it. Um, just to show you a, um, a thin section: uh, parochlor crystals, monazite crystals appear. And of course, nepheline and ribeckite shown in more blue, and the flow texture exhibited by first progress. Again, we're looking at, at, the, uh, at the flow texture due to a very, very liquid the movement of these of this type of thing. Now, the Gifford Creek Bogard occurs up here. And of course, the dispute, not everybody agrees with it, but this is a large igneous province. And most carbonatites do occur associated with large igneous provinces. They are the, the distal component 
of large ignis plants. This one here is the one Waracuna lip, and the, the, the focus of this Waracuna lip is up here in the Musgrave here, in the Giles intrusion, and the, the Gifford cucumber sits up there. Now, regarding Gifford cucumber, I see two, we did, did we carried out some uh, age dating, and we came up with two ages, 1075 million years and 1050 million years. And these two ages correspond to, hang on a minute, there we are. So, so the 1050 million years, 1050 correspond to a, a, the large ignis poverty event. And here you have the 1075 through here, and then the, as, it, as the, um, the um, mineralization continues, you develop in the iron oxides away, and that is a gifocrit ferrocarbonatite. So we have a uh, ages apatite and monazide ages, 1075 and 1050, like I mentioned before. There is other ages from Zietal in chemical geology, and they give ages 1360, 1280, 1175, 1070, so the ones that uh, we have reported, and, and 161, 1,360, it considers the emplacement age. I don't think that this, the, this is the age conundrum, which I will come back later regarding Bionobo. Now, again, Gifford Critical Bio Complex, according to Sles, I found recently published in Litters. They reckon that for the 1,370 million years, therefore not supporting a link with mantle primitivity. Now, let's look at Mount Weld. Mount Weld that stands up very nicely in the, in the magnetic image to here. Uh, this is a cross section. And Mount Weld, as you know, is mostly an open pit showing um, um, uh, due to lateritic ore. Which in that it goes, it's on top of the of the um, um, carbonatite. So the mantle sevite, we'll come back to that in a minute, contains apatite, mica, magnetite, phlogopite, terephlogite, pyrochlor, barite, fluorite, and so on and so on and so on. It has a very large <clears throat> uh, the regulated resources of 250 million tons of 18% uh, P205, 270 million tons of uh, niobium. Um, oxide, 140 million tons and so on, plus yttrium oxide. The general paragenesis calcite 1 to pyrochlor, ferriflogopite, calcite 2, calcite ephedronite, pyrite magnetite. Now, this is interesting because I found that later on, what we see here is cross, uh, this is the uh, a, um, core, of course, of the mantle carbonatite. And we can see these type of pictures, but this one here intrigued me because there's a shard-like textures of a glutinated carbonatitic ash. So what we're looking at effectively is a volcano, um, a, a carbonatite volcano. This is this, this is a cross section again, shard-like texture of glutinated carbonate shown here. The the um, lateritic materials it's up at top here, lateral capo, but when you look down in the section. It's a martin of diatrim formed by free automagmatic process, carbonatitic. That's what it is. It's a carbonatite volcano. Now, in Africa is a, perhaps the motherland of African of carbonatites. As you can see, lots of them around, particularly in East African rift system through here and all the way down to Namibia, in Angola. Palabora is a typical, another typical example. Now, let me go back a minute. So we look at this area here in a bit more detail. This is what I did quite a bit of work when I was in uh, you know, Rhodes University. And here you see that the, you have alkaline complexes, carbonatite and kimberlite. And carbonatites, kimberlite and alkaline do occur within the same geological setting. Here you can see them, carbonate complex shown by the, the red, red uh, polygon. And you can see lots of them around. In Namibia, and that again we can link that to a large igneous province because the the these system are due to Paranite and Deca large igneous province. So you have Namibia ring complex, a carbonatite aligned along transform faults, which are related to the Paranite and Deca large igneous province. Just to give you some examples, the Bramberg alkaline intrusion. There it is. Quite an amazing 
complex here and square higher than that, not the about 2,600 meters above sea level and 2,000 meters above the desert floor, a part of the Parana et Anteca large igneous province. Now, Okuruso, as an example, let me go back a minute. So, there are quite a few of these things, but Okuruso is one of them in the cyanide carbonate complex in Namibia. Again, just to give you an idea what these things look like, it's a partially carbonated nephelinite. The Okuruso cyanide carbonate complex contains iron ore in the forms of titaniferous magnetite, fluorspar, and apatite. The fluorspar apatite occurs as disseminations in orthoclasite, which is a kinetic operation. Vein deposit and replace within limestone units. <coughs> now, let's move on to the um, South Africa, the Bushveld igneous complex. Here it is. But the, here you have the Goudini carbonatite system, the Crit Fontaine. I worked on both of these, and Palabora, which is perhaps the most famous one. That's a Palabora. Um, it is a, a cyanitic material, but essentially carbonized. It's in the middle here. It's got chacobarite, bornite, magnetite, apatite, phosphorite, and so on. And it's kind of a beam mined. It's a copper deposit. The Goudini carbonate complex, just to give you an idea what it looks like, quite small, only about four, four or six kilometers across. And it has, it has a carbonate layers. There are veins, several dikes, and so on. Now, interesting thing about Goudini that you can see, even in thin section, you can see the miscibility between the, cal the calcitic grains and the silicate. <clears throat> so you have a miscible calcite spherule, spherules in silicate liquid. This is very interesting. And you can see the even in, just look at the thin section, you can see four centimeters long, and you can see this miscible liquid. Let's go to Bayanoba, <clears throat> the big one, the largest in the world, I think. Bayanoba has got bande fluoride, bustin aside. I'm not going to be dealt, but in the Mongolia, fluoride and magnetite. The interesting, it's the largest rare earth producer in the world. But when it was first discovered, it was discovered because of the magnetite. So it would be mined for iron. And eventually they realized the magnetite was only a minor component, not a lesser component, a lesser, less economic component. But in fact, it was mostly carbonate. They have the simplified geology of the Bayanobo, a main pit, of the east pit on the side. This is the, again, the age conundrum. You know, ages, you have ages around 500 million years, 1,500 million years, 2,000 million years. And this is really a, a big problem um, because it really, if, when it comes down to it, depends what is it that you are dating. And here you have, as you can see, the age conundrum persisting in this very large carbonate deposit. We published a paper recently in the geology, to Chinese colleagues, and this is the model we presented. You have a series of mafic alkaline carbonatic um, intrusions that come all the way, and eventually they find their way in the rift system, and this is where the final carbonatite, the bionobo carbonatite, sits. Trip in Mongolia was very interesting, and there are some carbonatite outcrops in Mongolia. There it is, it's nice and lovely here. And here too, you see calcite and dolomite also lie, which have here reflect liquid immiscibility. To give you an idea what these things look like on the second, I mean, in this section as a carbonatite petrography. But here, the interesting part is that you have this liquid immiscibility again, once again, showing very nicely. Um, let's go to, to, to my old home country. And here you have the, um, I visited the Vulture, which is a big volcano it's with carbonatite in it. It's a silicate carbonatite volcano. And uh, there are others, of course, in the area, mostly uh, extrusive carbonatite, carbonatite tukisite, various carbonatites in the Roman volcanic province. This is from uh, Francesco Stoppa. And this is the model we put together with Francesco Stoppa. And you have this geological model illustrate the relationship between intrusion, subvolcanic intrusion, volcanic carbonatite, and carbothermal system. 
based on Labour 1977. So effectively, this is the exclusive carbonatite. I won't go into great details. This is the actual carbonatite, the intrusive carbonatite, exclusive carbonatite, a carbothermal residual sitting in the volcano field. And the volcano we examine, in fact, is the, the um, let me go back a minute. This volcano here, the Vulture, is one such, something like this. And here you see something like 800, oops, 80 fallout tefra layers cut by fluvial channel, cut by pumice ash from the Vulture volcano. And these are carbonatite lapilli. Now, this is an active venting of carbon dioxide near the Vulture volcano, 500 to 750 tons a day. This is an ancient sacred site since about 3,000 3, years before present. And this is from uh, Francesco Stoppa et al., published in all geology reviews, a various types of orthomagmatic system, olivine, Montpellier, Garnet, Pericles, and calcite, carbothermal, and this is where the carbonate comes in, with fluoride, barite, celestine, anhydride, bastinocyte, and eventually hydrothermal, a lower temperature, which may be uh, not, which is related to carbonate as well. So this is effectively a synoptic scheme of carbonatite, fluorocarbonate, carbonate, fluoride deposit, and various textual and mineralogical features. Now, <laughs> let's look at the role of mantle and subcontinental lithospheric mantle. Mantle dynamics and carbonatites, rifts tend to form around cratonic margin, usually full of weak zone of orogenic belts. Crustal scale ductile to brittle ductile shear zones, control the location of rift structures, and of course, magma emplacement. And asthenospheric melt, rich in carbon, fluorine, chloride, and sulfur penetrated the overlying subcontinental lithospheric mantle, causing extensive metasomatism. The metasomatized subcontinental lithospheric mantle partially melts, producing alkaline and carbonate matter. So that's where the alkaline carbonate matter comes from. Now, one of the things that one must understand that the carbonatites and indeed the kimberlites are part and parcel large igneous provinces. There's no question about that. And uh, this is a model which shows the um, depicted the formation of rift related micro, cosana, carbonatites, uh, anorogenic granites, rhyolites, and so on. And as you can see, the C is a carbonatite. This is the zone of metasomatis, carbonate rich zone. And here you have the carbon dioxide sitting up there. And then, of course, you have phonolites, cyanide, the granite, and so on in a rift system. This is a book recently published by my colleague from uh, uh, Siberia, from Irkutsk, Nikolai Vladikin.